evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Our special guest tonight truly requires no introduction. Anyone who has ever had the privilege of crossing paths with him in their life knows how special he truly is. So please welcome Nick Damiano. Sharon Kelleher and her staff for their generous support. Thanks, Sharon, for your enthusiasm and for making this, this happen. It is much appreciated. I want to thank my son-in-law, Gary, who urged me to write it down, write it down. And I want to thank Guy for coming into our lives. I want to thank my daughters, Laura, Julie, and Cara. No father could be happier or prouder. Thank you for continuing to bring joy into my life. I want to thank my history wife and chairperson, Catherine Jones, <laughs> a great teacher, a compassionate listener, and cherished friend. I'd also like to thank my principal, Kathy O'Connell, who had this absolutely crazy idea. She said, Nick, if you speak, they will come. <laughs> I am humbled and honored. I could not have a finer boss or friend. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to thank my wife, Maria. No words are necessary. No words are adequate. Thank you for coming out tonight so we can spend a few moments together. As I look out, I see many familiar faces of students, parents, friends, and colleagues. I am Nick Damiano, Mr. D or commonly known to my students as LMU, Lord Master of the Universe. <laughs> an apt and accurate description, I think, at least until I get home. And then I'm most commonly known as FPC, Family Personal Chef. <laughs> I was born about 100 years ago in a village called Orsonia, in a stone hut without running water or electricity in the Apennine Mountains of Abruzzo, Italy. We had no cameras, so no pictures exist. But I'm standing where it stood. I think it's only fitting that it was in the middle of olive, gray, olive trees, where they were pressed by a huge stone into first cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> How appropriate. I have distinct memories of my childhood in Arsonia. I remember my grandfather putting me on his mule and making the uphill climb from the farm to the village piazza to sell the grapes that fill the wicker baskets on each side of the mule. I can still smell the lather on the mule's back as it made a steep trip up the mountain. I remember my mother getting water every day from the well, pouring it into her cup of conga and bringing it home balanced on her head. These are today's women in Orsonia recreating that practice. I remember the itchiness of husking corn during harvest. I remember the excitement of the family watching the men slaughter a pig and knowing the padrone would let us keep a portion of it. I remember the musty smell of grapes being crushed by women in a giant wooden vat. I remember huddling around the fireplace at night, trying to keep warm. We placed bricks in the fire, and when they got hot, we would wrap them in a towel and bring it into bed and hope that they would keep us warm until morning. Because of this experience, I do not share the romantic notions of fireplaces. <laughs> I have never used the fireplace in our home. When I came to this country, I was absolutely fascinated that you could go up to a dial and automatically get heat in every room. Every room. <laughs> I will never use the fireplace. My parents were sharecroppers with no formal education. World War II destroyed my village. Since it overlooked an important valley, the Germans and Allies fought over control of this strategic location. Orsonia was flattened to rubble. I didn't know that photos existed of this time, but during my last visit to Orsonia, I learned that the Allies had taken photos and that they were in the municipal building. I made some copies. This last slide is where my wife Maria was born. 
She always reminds me that I was born on the side of a mountain, but that she was a city girl. <laughs> Not quite Manhattan. <laughs> when our Sonia was liberated at the end of the war, it was not only devastated, but the Germans had mined the valley leading to our Sonia. When the villagers came out of the mountains where they had to live in caves, they returned to their farms and did what farmers do. They began to turn the soil and plant crops for their survival. This is a photo of the caves taken at that time and a more recent photo of the monument erected by the government to honor those people. The mines were not all cleared, however, and every time you hit an explosion, you knew another farmer had been killed. There were more mercenaries killed after the war than during the war. Needless to say, life was hard. And so began the mass immigration for a better life, to the center of the world, to a magical land, to America. My family pooled what money they had, and my father, being the youngest of the family, was given a one-way ticket by boat to America. He worked construction here for four years until he earned enough money to send for my mother and me. We embarked on the USS Constitution. No, not old Ironsides, but the ocean liner. And 11 days later, I was in La America, in New York City. Up until then, the tallest building I had ever seen was the church in Arsonia. Now I was in New York Harbor, staring up at the skyline of Manhattan. My God, it was all true. This was La Medica. And I was here to collect some of the gold I had heard was strewn throughout the streets, <laughs> simply ready for the picking. I'm still looking for that gold. <laughs> but I did find something more valuable, opportunity. I remember spending that first night in New York City before heading to Boston the next morning. We stayed at a cousin's house in Astoria. I learned my first words of English. After dinner, my father, who I had not seen in four years, walked over to a wooden box and pulled a knob. He called it a TV. A few seconds later, I saw people inside that box. It was a bald man with an earring. And I remember learning my first English phrase. Mr. Queen, clean your house and everything that's in it. Mr. Queen, Mr. Queen, Mr. Queen. I've learned many more words since then. I want to start out tonight the way I start every class, by asking the question of the day. Today's question of the day is, how do you educate a child? A simple question but one that I believe is the essential foundation of teaching. I believe that this question must be answered and understood and embraced before any meaningful teaching can begin. You have to know where you are going before you can figure out how to get there. This quote has been on the front wall of my classroom for many years. It is also on the first page and the last page of my professional portfolio. It describes beautifully my vision of education. I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated, and a child humanized or dehumanized. I know that teachers have a tremendous influence on their students, both good and bad. A bad experience can leave its mark forever. An uplifting, positive experience does the same thing. I choose to always try to make it positive, some days more successfully than others. But the goal is always the same, to provide students with an academically and emotionally fulfilling experience that they will carry throughout their lives. To be able to teach effectively, you first have to get the students to want to come into your classroom. If they want to be there, you can teach them anything. They also have to know that you want to be there. 
that you would rather be in that classroom with them than anywhere else. That you care about them. And they will genuinely care about you. Once they feel their mutual respect, the magic begins. Teaching began at the beginning of time, when someone first pointed at something, and someone explained what it was. A teacher. Fundamentally, teaching today follows that same principle. A question of curiosity is asked, and someone answers that question, with the hope that it leads to another question, and another question. Methods change, technology changes, the environment changes, but at its core, at its core, teaching remains the same. This is a picture of my friend Sean. He is teaching in a one-room mud hut in Nepal. He has one piece of chalk and a handheld chalkboard. I teach in a magnificent new school with extraordinary cutting-edge technology. But we each endeavor to do the same thing, inspire students to think. Technology is essential and wonderful, but as an adjunct to teaching, not as its goal. The goal should be that the student in Nepal and the student in our spectacular school have the same look of amazement. As the inspirational Malala poignantly says, one child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. In Judaism, there is a prayer set for all those who pass away called the Kaddish. But there is a special prayer that is set for only one group, teachers. I think the ultimate goal of the teacher is that the teacher becomes the student, and the student the teacher. And I've always believed that if something is important to teach, it's important to teach it to everyone. There is only one reason I am an educator today. Charlie Jones. Mr. Jones. After spending a summer on one of his legendary summer western trips as a parent chaperone, he took me aside one morning and told me I had the gift. I naturally assumed that he meant that I had cooked some great meals for 45 people. <laughs> but he meant something else. He would not accept my protest that I could not get my teaching license, since I was a full-time stay-at-home dad raising three girls. But he would not take no for an answer. And here I am. The best piece of advice I was ever given on teaching came from Charlie. We were in Gettysburg on the eighth grade fall trip. Mr. Jones was lecturing about Pickett's charge. I was so taken by how animated and passionate he was. After the students went back to the buses, I went over to Mr. Jones and told him how impressed I was with his vibrant presentation. I told him I knew he had probably done that presentation a thousand times over the course of 35 years. He turned to me and said, Yes, Mr. Damiano, but it's the first time with this group. I have modeled my teaching on that simple yet profound statement. When I can no longer teach like it's the first time, I will no longer teach. But I think I still have many first times left in me. 25 years ago, my wife and I noticed that our middle daughter, Julia, wasn't quite hitting her developmental milestones. She rocked a lot, and she would have bouts of uncontrollable laughter for no apparent reason. She did not develop language, but she did some things phenomenally well, like line up magnetic letters of the alphabet correctly on her refrigerator when still in her walker, or find our car in a shopping mall parking lot by the license plate number. We thought we had a special child. We did. We didn't realize how special. Your daughter has autism. The diagnosis left us stunned. But after the initial shock, 
Was this still not our beautiful Julia? Did this, did this diagnosis suddenly make her someone else? Wasn't she still part of this family? I would not have her diagnosis destroy our family. But it was hard. These were the early days of autism when nothing was known, when it was scary, when the rate was 1 in 14,000, not 1 in 68 as it is today. They were limited services. My wife and I did things by the seat of our pants. We would not give up on her. We were told all the things she would not be able to do. Says so, who? Don't impose your limitations on my family. I always tell my students, stay away from people that tell you all the things you cannot do. She would have a vibrant, wonderful life. We would not accept anything else. When Julie was a baby, I couldn't understand why she was squirm when being hugged. We are an Italian family. <laughs> so I would hold her tight in my arms until she couldn't fight anymore. Night after night. My wife would wipe the sweat off of my face from the exertion. Night after night. And then it clicked. Julia grew to accept and love being hugged. Those of you who know Julia know how much she now loves to hug, which in our family is a lot. By the way, the technique we use actually now has a name. It's called the holding technique. Who knew? <laughs> Sleep was an enormous lifelong issue with autism, and Julie was no exception. She would get up throughout the night. We could not have that situation. I realized that she had no concept of time at night. Sometimes when she got up in the middle of the night, I would put her right back to bed. But sometimes, if it was close to dawn, I would let her go downstairs. It must have been confusing to Julia. That same day when I realized this, I went to Walmart and bought an alarm clock with big digital numbers and blocked off the minutes so that only the hour was showing. That night at bedtime, I said to Julia, five downstairs, five downstairs, five downstairs. Then I slept in the corridor outside her bedroom door. When I heard her get up, I pointed to the clock and said, five downstairs, five downstairs, five downstairs. After two weeks, it clicked. Julia now sleeps throughout the night and doesn't get up until she sees the five. I remember my grandfather in Italy used to say, you have to bend the tree when it's young. We did the hard work early. Now, however, I so, so wish I had started with six downstairs. <laughs> the most important thing we did, however, was that we never forgot we had three daughters. They each needed our love and attention. Perhaps Julie would be a bit more advanced if we had spent time with just her, but it would have been at the expense of our family and marriage. I think we took the right path. Our daughters love each other, and my wife, even after all these 43 years, still finds me amusing and loves my risotto. <laughs> I tell my students that one of the advantages of having someone my age as their teacher is that when we talk about the fall of Rome or Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I can give them eyewitness accounts. <laughs> in fact, if you ask any of my students what happened in AD 476, they will in unison reply, well, Mr. Damiano was sitting in front of the Colosseum, minding his own business and enjoying a cup of espresso. <laughs> When our oyster and his ostrogoths came and ruined Mr. Damiano's entire day. <laughs> and I asked them, what's the most important event of that day? And they respond, during the onslaught on Rome, Mr. Damiano didn't spill a drop of his espresso. <laughs> and what is of secondary importance, I asked? Well, Rome fell that day. <laughs> they will never forget 18476. By the way, some teachers mistakenly teach that A.D. stands for Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. 
But my students all know that it actually stands for? After Donnelly. <laughs> After Donnelly. <laughs> yes, I am officially the oldest teacher in the district. But as Mark Twain said, age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and where it really counts, here and here, I am very young. Now if I could just get the rest of my body in sync. <laughs> About five years ago, my left eye suddenly began to get red and painful from a tremendous buildup of pressure. I was diagnosed with uveitis in the middle of the night at Mass Eye and Air. I had an eye pressure of 48. For those of you who might have glaucoma, you know what that pressure means and the method used to relieve that pressure. Fortunately, the finest uveitic ophthalmologist in the world is located in Boston. And my wife, who loves me, and my talents in the kitchen, I think in that order. <laughs> Scheduled an appointment for me with him. He said, Mr. Damiano, I'm going to open up your eyeball and implant the shunt and then close it back up. <laughs> I said, wonderful, let's get on with it. And oh, he added, you'll have to be awake during the surgery. Why, of course, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> The surgery was a success, but even with the shunt, it will be a lifelong condition and struggle. There is still a 30% chance of going blind. Now, I don't teach math, but it seems to me that that means there's a 70% chance that I won't. Better to light a candle than curse the darkness. I didn't join any of the support groups for uveitis, it's just not me. I would rather spend that time being supported by friends in the North End, over in Oso Buco, and a gold Monte Pulciano, followed by a tiramisu and espresso. <laughs> now if I want a nice Brunello, I buy and drink a nice Brunello. If I want a good bourbon, I drink a good bourbon. Woodford Reserve Double Oak, thank you. <laughs> by the way, my daughters and son-in-law are all for this, since they would not buy it on their own and have convinced me that I would certainly want to share such a bonding experience with them. <laughs> it also reminds me of my daughter's study abroad in Florence. They said they waited to go to the really expensive restaurant until I got there, so we could share the experience together. <laughs> How thoughtful. <laughs> we talk about a lot of things in my class. Obviously, we talk about history. History is a story of everything, of government, of society, of literature, of music, of art. History is a story of where we were, where we are, where we are going, and how we're going to get there. My job is to connect dots. This happened. It caused this to happen. And then it led to this. And, oh, I get it. That is why we have the conflict in the Middle East. My job is to develop informed citizens of the world. My job is not to teach someone what to think, but to teach someone how to think. Here is what this group thinks and why. And here is what this other group thinks and why. Now, what do you think? The one thing that parents most often comment on to me is that their child now listens to the news before coming to school and now initiates, initiates conversations around the dinner table or explains the influence and importance of the Sunni Shiite schism. Wonderful. But we talk about a lot of other things. We talk about beauty and joy and honor. We talk a lot about honor in my class and what it means. When everything else is taken away from you, you still have your honor. And that can never be taken away from you. Unless you give it away. I have never sent anyone to the office. I have never given out a detention. For me, it's just more effective to have that student look me in the eye and explain why they have let me down, but more importantly, why they have let themselves down. And always, always, 
end with what can we now do to make it right. We talk a lot about food. Why? Well, it is in my DNA. And it does bring great pleasure to life, especially my family's life. But what else? It is our earliest memory of fulfillment. A particular smell or taste can instantly trigger a specific moment, or time, or emotion. You begin to learn about right and wrong while still in the high chair, while being fed by parents or grandparents. Those words they spoke, between bites of food, they were invaluable and recorded in the child's developing brain. It helped me establish the foundation for the type of person he or she would become. Those lessons continued and matured around the kitchen table, further building on the moral life of that child. Food is also the international language. It is the one language understood by all, by all societies, by all religions. It is the one thing that binds all people together and could help solve some of the problems of the world. If you could just get the Israelis and Palestinians to sit around the kitchen table with great food, eventually they would have to start talking, especially if I'm cooking. <laughs> Who could possibly be angry at anyone while eating my bugatini alla matichana? And it works for our marriage, too. If my wife and I have an occasional spat over some trivial matter, she always apologizes to me. <laughs> Not because I'm right, but because eventually she gets hungry. <laughs> Guys, learn how to be a terrific cook. The best story about food involves Julia. We came home from New Hampshire one weekend and it was late at night. It occurred to me that I did not make gravy for her lunches that week. Yes, I call it gravy. It was so late, I was just not going to make gravy at that hour. So I did the unthinkable. I ran to stop the shop. I know, I'm filled. Before it closed, and bought a jar of marinara sauce. After putting Julie into bed, I heated up the sauce put it over the pasta, and got her lunch ready in a Tupperware container. The next morning, I sent her off to her day program. When she arrived home later that day, I got her communication book and read the day's log from her teacher. It said, Mr. Damiano, something unusual happened today. <laughs> Julia usually loves lunch, but she took her first bite spit it out, <laughs> pushed her Tupperware away, and signed, all done, all done. <laughs> That's my baby. <laughs> Things are never boring in my classroom. I am the biggest kid there. If I'm bored, they're bored, and I'm never bored. If I'm excited, they're excited, and I'm always excited. <clears throat> And I love having history conversations with my wife. Like, she asks, why are you buying a giant Crayola? What is wrong with you? <laughs> Obviously, these are the wooden stakes the English used as a defense against the Norman Knights on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> why are you buying two mops? What is wrong with you? Obviously, these are the legendary horses, Tea Biscuit and Buttercup. <laughs> How else could the Crusaders get to Jerusalem? Recently, I received an email from a student I had many years ago, inquiring whether Tea Biscuit and Buttercup were still alive. <laughs> alive and still kicking, like their owner. Why are you buying a blue plastic tablecloth? What is wrong with you? Obviously, this is the English Channel that William, the Duke of Normandy, had to cross to win the crown of England. <laughs> Why are you buying a giant binder? What is wrong with you? Obviously, this is the original Magna Carta, on loan to me from Great Britain. Why are you bringing a Slurpee cup to school? What is wrong with you? 
How else can I teach you about the Moors' invasion of the Iberian Peninsula? It was hot in Northern Africa. They were looking for Slurpees. <laughs> they came over in... 7-Eleven. <laughs> Why are you buying a red rose and a white rose? Oh, wait, I get it. The War of the Roses in England. She's starting to get it. <laughs> in my class, we have a student philosopher of the week. He or she puts up a daily philosophy on the whiteboard. Some are moving and memorable. You don't stop dreaming and exploring because you grow old. You grow old because you stop dreaming and exploring. Don't ruin a good today by thinking about a bad yesterday. Don't raise your voice. Improve your argument. And some are just humorous. All my life I wanted to be somebody. Now I see that I should have been more specific. <laughs> Only the mediocre are always at their best. <laughs> All of these class activities help build the culture of a class and helps unify that class. How many memories of students do I remember? All of them. I remember a girl who, when I passed back a test, raised her hand and informed me that I had marked a question right when in fact it was wrong. I looked at her and said, don't change that score and add one point. I remember a certain student who painted a giant ceiling tile of me driving a Viper. It hangs proudly in my room. Recently I was out sick, which is unusual because I'm never out sick because I eat so much garlic. <laughs> I don't know if it's the medicinal properties of the garlic or the fact that sick people stay away from me. <laughs> but when I returned the next day, the sub told me that painting and what the student had written on it was intimidating. class the nautical term for sailing around the world. One student quickly raised his hand. He did not say circumnavigation. <laughs> <laughs> Something close, but it had an entirely different meaning. I believe every child wants to do well, to feel connected, to feel successful to feel wanted, to feel smart, because they are. But sometimes for some students, their path can be confused and filled with pitfalls right from the start, often not of their own making. The road becomes more chaotic with each passing year, along with an increasing sense of failure. Unfortunately, too many times, the child begins to succumb to that expected failure and reacts either by giving up on the educational process or lashing out as a discipline issue. The role of the teacher is to first build trust with that student and begin to break that entrenched sense of failure. There is always a way. There is always a way. I have been blessed to work with a dedicated group of teachers who share that belief. I remember one particular student a number of years ago. He had been suspended four times. Clearly it wasn't working. The office called and told me the student, who well, I'll call John, was having a very difficult morning and asked if they could bring him to my room. The more the merrier, I told him. He was escorted to my room. I met him at the door and said, good morning, John. Nice to have you visit my class. With a surly look, he started to walk past me. Excuse me. We have manners and a code of conduct in this class. For me and anyone in this classroom. Let's try this again. Good morning, John. Good morning, he muttered. I have a name just like you. Good morning, John. 
Good morning, Mr. D. He said under his breath. He went to sit down in the back of the class. No, not there, John. Sit in this seat at the front, so you'll be able to hear me, as if that was going to be a problem. He came to the front seat and slouched down. After the question of the day, I asked the class to get their homework out. I said, John, come help me check homework around the classroom. What? Come help me check homework. He looked like a deer in headlights. We went from student to student checking homework. The first period was a bit rough and awkward. But by the second period, as he stood beside me, John got the idea of what was acceptable for homework. By now, he had also heard the class lesson twice. When there was a question by a student whether the homework was enough to get a check mark, I said, I don't know. Ask John. By the third period, I asked him questions that I knew he would have the answers to. He was no longer slouching at his desk. By the fifth period, I had him do the four corners questions game that we do in class. A student starts in one corner of the class and answers as many questions as possible while going corner to corner. John walked with confidence and looked straight at me, anticipating the next questions. He answered many questions. At the end of the last period, he asked me if he should wait for someone from the office to escort him back. No, I said. You can go yourself. Thank you for helping me out today, John. I enjoyed having you in my class. As he walked past me, he said something softly, very softly. But I heard him. Thanks, Mr. D. Thank you. It was a good day. There have been many good days. There will be many more good days. I remember a young lady who came to, to visit my class three years after I had her. She looked nervous and her lips were trembling. I asked her if everything was okay. She said she came by to visit me on a number of occasions, but only today did she actually come in. She said she wanted to thank me for believing in her in eighth grade inspiring her to go to college, to apply to college, and that she wanted to be a history teacher. I remember a beautiful, touching letter from a student thanking me for helping him get through the death of his father. He paid me the highest compliment. He wrote that how I treated him reminded him of his father. How sweet. How tender, how poignant. Before I went out for knee replacement surgery, a student gave me an envelope filled with inspirational quotes for every day that I would be out. Last week I had a poster left on my doorstep, signed by my students with both funny and uplifting messages. I feel their affection. They feel mine. I love being a teacher. All these memories and all the memories to come, they are as powerful as any drug my doctor can give me. And the only side effect is contentment. They help me fulfill my emotional life and motivate me to get up every morning and be LMU to my students. I have no plans to retire. Retire to what? Could I find something in retirement that would give me greater satisfaction? Well, maybe <coughs> opening up a trattoria called Mr. D's. <laughs> but I guess I already have that. It's just called my home. About three years ago, I began to notice that my left hand started to not work so well. It began to affect my blazing typing speed of 15 words a minute. 
Getting dressed was taking longer. My left leg didn't feel right. My left arm was not working right. I couldn't seem to get into the sleeve of my shirts. Buttoning buttons became a time-consuming chore. And putting socks on became an adventure every morning. At a wedding reception, I noticed I couldn't get my rhythm while dancing. I just couldn't seem to float over the dance floor. My wife told me that shouldn't be a real concern since I could never float over the dance floor. <laughs> I noticed things on my left side, and so did she. At first, I just assumed it was my uveitis, since it was also the left eye that was affected. But symptoms didn't go away. It wasn't the eye. It couldn't possibly be another calamity. We made an appointment with a neurologist. Mr. Damiano, you have Parkinson's. We were numb and frightened. But not for long. I quickly drew strength from the love of my family and friends and students. I've done all my research, all of it. I know all the things that might happen. I know what is happening. But I choose not to concentrate on these. What purpose would it serve? Absolutely none. It would only serve negativity and depression, and I will have none of it. I absolutely insist, and I'm completely committed, I'm focusing not only on the wonderful life that I have, but on what I can do every single day to make that wonderful life with my wife, my kids, my friends, and my students even more joyous and passionate. That the best days are still ahead, waiting for me to experience them and to make them even better for me and everyone I can touch. Of all the things that might happen, the one that seems to concern me the most is that I may lose my voice. I don't think so! <laughs> I recall an episode a number of years ago. I had a hearing challenge student in my classroom. And he had forgotten his hearing aids that day. <laughs> His paraprofessional was concerned that he might miss the content of that class. Then I noticed his parents started to laugh. She came up to me to show me a note that he had written. <laughs> Why do I dress this way? Why do I continue to wear a shirt and tie every day? It's a reflection of how I feel about my profession. My neurologist says that stubbornness will serve me well in the future. My wife describes it with another S word, and it's not stubborn. <laughs> she constantly comments that there are nice polo shirts. Now I do not hesitate to do things. I don't wait for a better time, or that it's too much work, or that it takes too much time. If I can do something that brings someone joy, which also brings me joy, I do it that day. If I want to bring a bouquet of flowers to my youngest daughter at her office in Boston in the middle of the day, I do it. The look on her face is all I need. If I want to send a card 
to my oldest daughter every day for three weeks while she was studying for the bar exam in New York. I do it. Knowing what it will mean to her is all I need. Bringing Joni to her favorite restaurant for fuzili with sausage and broccoli at Ave and seeing that smile is all I need. And my wife, she is all I need. You gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. I will not have Parkinson's define me. I will have how I react to Parkinson's define me. I cannot change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails, and I have. It's really not about the money, or the houses, or the cars. Not really. They're important components of living life, but ultimately, it's not what gives meaning to our lives. At the end of my days, 50 years from now, I'm going to look up, and hopefully, if I've done things right, I'm going to see family and friends, and maybe a student or two. And I will take solace from the accumulated memories that I can draw upon to give validity to my life. So, what is the answer to this magnificent dance we call life? What is the question? What do you want out of life? What gives you joy? What gives you satisfaction? What are you willing to do to achieve it? What are you willing to let go? Appreciate and experience fully every day, every hour, every moment, this moment. I am one lucky guy. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And good night. One last slide that didn't play for some reason, and it's Julia with her iPad. And she loaded up the toolbar with, I love you, Dad. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.